Hello, I'm Robert Bastian of Laryngopedia and Bastian Voice Institute. This is a discussion of sensory neuropathic cough and its treatments. Now, some watching this video already know about sensory neuropathic cough and they just want to get to the list of potential treatments. And if you're in that group, you can jump to the time code uh, noted here and just get straight to the treatment options. But for those who are a little more new to the disorder, here's a summary. Sensory neuropathic cough is chronic, intractable, or sometimes recurrent coughing that is neurological. Uh, it's not inflammatory, infectious, it's not uh, anything but neurological. We think of it as being the result of damaged nerve endings, usually somewhere in the throat, uh, caused by a virus, caused by thyroid surgery, some other kind of trauma, and in many cases, it's unknown. The coughing just started in it, it, and there's never a way to know exactly what caused these damaged nerve endings. But basically, damaged nerve endings don't go silent necessarily. Instead, they can go jittery and unstable. The, the threshold for their firing is reduced. And so these damaged nerve endings can create any sensation that it is possible to have. It could be a tickle could be a very sudden feeling of a dry patch, sandpaper. It could be a pinprick. It could be a dripping sensation, pressure, a feeling that of inhaling dust. But whenever it happens, it's usually very abrupt in onset, and it immediately initiates coughing or throat clearing. Now, uh, often people with sensory neuropathic cough their coughing is spontaneous. It occurs who knows why uh, all across the day. But many people with SNC have identified triggers, meaning things that make it more likely that they will cough. Things like talking for a while, a loud laugh, um, taking a very deep breath, breathing in cold air, breathing in warm air, touching a certain spot on their neck, change of position, such as bending over or getting in bed at night or sitting in a car in that semi-backward position, uh, those things make it more likely that they will cough. And uh, the number of coughs can be a few per day, but not at all infrequently. A person might cough two or three hundred times a day, and unfortunately, while most of them can be little <coughs> or <coughs> and then they're done, they may have a percentage of their coughs that are protracted and violent. <clears throat> so they might have a violent attack of coughing that goes on for 10 or 20 seconds, for a minute, even a few minutes. So you can imagine the, the distress of that kind of cough in public especially. Now, the physical response can be dramatic. The, the nose might run, the eyes tear up, there could be gagging, there could be uh, nearly throwing up, even actually throwing up. Um, people uh, leak urine, unfortunately, or worse. And they'll say at the end of a really aggressive attack of coughing that their, their ribs even hurt. We've even had a few people who broke their own rib from the violence of the coughing. Um, now, when people develop sensory neuropathic cough, there's usually a long delay from onset to diagnosis. And they usually get treated for what I call the usual suspects, allergy, acid reflux, and asthma. So they've been on puffers, they've been on postnasal drip medicines, nasal inhalers, asthma puffers, uh, I mean, you name it. Steroids occasionally help temporarily, cough suppressants usually not. So basically, they've been everywhere, done everything, and they get absolutely nowhere with it all. Now, uh, it's not reasonable that people who've done all of this searching for a uh, solution become either, they become skeptical, they become even cynical sometimes, and occasionally they'll even become a little hostile to the medical profession, and it's understandable because of the amount of time and energy and money that they've spent and gotten absolutely nowhere with this crazy kind of coughing. Now, um, 
when we meet a new patient with sensory neuropathic cough, we explain to them that the treatment isn't for allergy, acid reflux, or asthma. Usually we're getting people off of those kinds of medicines if they have no other reason to take them and they're not working. Uh, instead, we're going to use nerve ending medicines, the same thing that might be used for painful diabetic feet, for shingles pain, that kind of thing. Say while 80% of people usually respond to the first or second one, a very good response is defined as 70 or 80% reduction. We often don't get rid of the coughing 100%, but we can generally make it major improvement so that it's diminished markedly, but not necessarily abolished. And by the way, when people have been uh, coughing for years and years, sometimes the treatment for their cough is a permanent addition to their medical care, uh, though if the cough comes under unusually good control, we uh, suggest that people try tapering off here now and again to see if they can get off of the medicine. So let's now just make that list that some people just are going to jump right to this section. So I'm just going to list off the medicines. Now keep in mind, when we meet a person with sensory neuropathic cough, we don't go through every medicine in brutal detail because we would be talking for an hour to get through all of the, the little tweaks and pointers and side effects and things to watch for. So we usually describe the first option and then maybe describe the second option and then we say the third or fourth or fifth or sixth, we will describe and explain when the time comes. But just to give you the, the sense of the list, amitriptyline, it's an old time antidepressant, is usually our first medicine and in older people sometimes desipramine or nortriptyline, they're all like penicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin, they're all cousins. Amitriptyline uh, is usually first and we use it in very low dose. Gabapentin, originally a seizure medicine, is usually number two, sometimes Lyrica, its cousin, but not very often. Then sometimes SNRIs like uh, duloxetine and venlafaxine, sometimes citalopram, which is an SSRI. Then there's topical capsaicin spray. Uh, we've had to find a pharmacy that would compound this for us. It's basically what we call <coughs> our hot pepper spray. Look up capsaicin spray on Laryngopedia, there's a whole article that explains the rationale on how to use it. And then uh, finally, we use sometimes injections. And I'll see if I can use this model to show you if the uh, tickle or other sensation is quite high in the neck, we'll inject the superior laryngeal nerves, which are about right here in there. And if the, the tickle is way down at the sternal notch, we inject pretracheally down in this area of the neck. And there are a few people where that works extremely well, though unfortunately it usually has to be repeated. And a more recent treatment that we're still evaluating is called naltrexone. Naltrexone is an opioid receptor blocker and uh, it's used for our purpose in, in very low dose, far lower than it's used for other purposes. And it's a big discussion about uh, why it might work, uh, and again, it's just something to, to know it that is on the list, especially for people who are not responding to other medications. Uh, there is a new medicine called gefepixant. We've made lots of inquiries, and, and unfortunately, we can't get a hold of it for a brief trial with some of our tougher patients, but we're keeping our eye on gefepixant, a newer medicine, um, and there's Botox, I would say we're not huge fans of Botox because while you can improve the cough in some people, the price you pay in weakening a voice is, is a bit much in, in my experience. And then finally, years ago, I thought about, but I've never actually found the device for a, a counter irritant. Capsaicin is the counter irritant inside, but we thought about a counter irritant a vibratory counter irritant, like a little vibrating device to see if we could, uh, you know, quiet or, or distract these damaged nerve endings. Well, uh, that is a discussion I around the world in 90 seconds, kind of a big picture discussion. And uh, 
take the list to your personal physician. Um, we put all the names on the screen, so you can take that to your personal physician and say, could I try one of these medicines if you're not in the Chicago area and not able to come by Bastion Boys Institute. So I hope that helps, and thanks for listening.